Philip, thank you so much for being on stage with me here. Super excited to chat. Um, we do want to make this a pretty interactive session, so we would ask that you know at any time if you want to double click into something that Philip says or hear more about a specific topic, just jump in, uh, you know, raise a hand, and, and we'll try and incorporate some audience questions as part of this uh, fireside chat to keep it interactive. But um, uh, again, thank you for being on stage with me here. I take it most people in the audience have, uh, have at least heard of Babel or maybe used it. But for those who haven't, uh, potentially those watching the recorded version of this, could you just spend a minute or two, tell us a little bit more about the company and give us a sense for kind of the scale and how successful the, the business has been in the last 10 plus years? Sure. Um, did you just say double click, by the way, into something I say? <laughs> so raising your hands also works. <laughs> um, so yeah, Bubble um, is uh, perhaps uh, better known here in, in Europe uh, than in the US, although if you listen to NPR or uh, some of the news channels on, on, on TV in, in the US, you might know the, the company quite well as well. Um, we're basically a language learning um, app um, that has broadened its portfolio and, uh, and teaches you languages via different methods, such as language travel uh, now as well. Um, we headquartered here in Berlin, um, just around the corner, and are um, probably the world's highest grossing um, language learning app. That's awesome. Um, so many of the entrepreneurs in the, in the room here today are you know, earlier in their journeys and either just trying to get their product to market or figuring out you know, the early stages of how to scale and, and market their business and product. C can you just give some maybe you know, examples or um, experiences that you have as to how they can unlock this kind of organic growth early on in the product's um, life cycle and generate this virality that um, a lot of the best businesses, including Babel, get, uh, whether through product or marketing or both? Yeah. Um, so. Um, interestingly, we um, we weren't sort of this home run um, viral success like Instagram. If you were here just uh, a minute ago, right? Instagram, I think, got sold when they were 50 employees or something for a billion dollars. Um, we we never had sort of this this home run um, viral uh, momentum, um, and that's perhaps also more of a US um, model where you really build an audience first and then figure out the business model. Um, European companies are perhaps a little more uh, traditional and uh, even though Germans are probably known for being sort of manufacturing um, led product driven um, companies, actually, and that holds true particularly for the Berlin ecosystem, um, we are actually quite a marketing heavy um, say industry and and get your guide is, is an example or, or many of the other um, berlin based companies that have gone public in the us or, or are known um, for um, for their success outside of germany and so for us that holds true as well um, we did quite early on experiment quite a bit with uh, different um, models and um, one of the key successes for us was actually the business model itself so having a subscription model as opposed to a freemium or ad-driven model um, led to a lot of our early success because the proposition to the customer was extremely clear. You have to pay, but what you get is quality. And um, you get better than free. Um, and um, what you then can also expect is a absolute um, focus on your learning success. Um, because what we found early on is that if we were to introduce middleman in the form of advertisers, mm. um, our incentives would be misaligned. And customers aren't stupid. Um, they understand, learners understand um, what drives your business and what uh, makes you uh, like pay the bills. Um, and so for us, that was very important to be very clear to its, our learners. You're the first and only concern that we have. And um, you pay us, and we deliver uh, in return. And, and that worked quite well. Um, and it holds true actually in the later stages of the learning experience as well. Because if you have an advertising driven model, your incentives are to keep people engaged in the product um, because that drives eyeballs and, or, or impressions. Okay. And um, longer retention or engagement with learning doesn't necessarily translate into best learning success. So there's um, sort of spaced repetition that lets you come back, but also have space in between. Yeah, yeah. The, the notion of the kind of upfront paywall. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. 
um, you know, again, the benefit is obviously you have this hurdle for which, you know, a user has to get, uh, you know, they have to climb over, but once, once they do, presumably that ends up in more engaged and higher re retaining users. The flip side is that uh, potentially your funnel kind of is reduced, right? You, you, have, you create this, this wall that uh, prevents, you know, usage of the product before uh, paying. So, you know, I guess, how do you balance the two and, and um, how do you get users and customers excited about the product? and um, recognize that, hey, this is something I do want to pay for if you don't have kind of a, you know, a, a free or kind of a freemium version of the product to use. Yeah, so um, we, did, we do shift quite a bit of the experience before the paywall to, to let people experience um, part of the product. Um, but we, we hit them at the same time quite hard, quite quickly, um, with a, with a, a gate um, to, to make uh, a decision. Um, and uh, and what, we, what we experienced in that uh, process was that we had shifted quite a lot of the experience in the front um, to sort of as you were onboarding through the funnel to experience a lesson and click through different aspects of it. We realized that actually shifting or, or creating much more of a lean funnel um, actually helps conversion quite a lot. Yeah. Um, people much quicker make up their mind whether they want to learn with Babel or not than we originally thought. Um, and, and that allowed us to, to widen the, um, the funnel uh, a bit again. Um, and perhaps one, one comment on sort of the um, interest and um, generating the interest. We do a lot of um, organic. Um, Organic, you need to differentiate, right? That's sort of paid and organic. And organic is often confused with sort of, oh, it's free advertising or it's just like viral um, growth. Yeah. But um, there's sort of perhaps the Instagram type um, growth where you literally don't have any marketing people and you just have pure user word of, earned, of mouth. Earned media uh, concept. Yes. Yeah. And um, at the same time, you also have organic as in SEO, um, high rankings on Google, right? And um, that isn't free because obviously you have staff who work on content. And um, that is a significant part of our business. We do have um, a magazine, which sounds very traditional in paper, but it's actually uh, social media, YouTube, um, and, uh, and traditional web articles. Um, and we use that for organic rankings, but also for paid um, and native advertising. Yeah, got it. Um, so you, we touched earlier on kind of the, the brand you've, you've built. In, in fact, I just want to do a quick poll. By, by show of hands, uh, how many people have actually, whether used or heard of Babbel before this uh, talk? This is in, that's incredible. That's like 90% maybe aided awareness? That, that's not, this is not something you build um, overnight and something you can't just buy, right? Um, so can you just talk maybe a little bit in, in more detail? How do you, have you built the brand? Uh, right, and you talked about kind of the initial organic adoption and then amplifying that with some paid, but brand and investing in brand and kind of non-performance media as well is, is a whole different ball game. Mm. So how have, you, how have you guys kind of tackled that and, and built this like 90% uh, awareness in this room? Yeah, holds true for Germany actually, <laughs> about the sort of, um, and so the, um, I guess brand awareness today is largely a function of our spend. Um, we have to be quite clear. Um, and um, while we're not a, a coin-operated business, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that concept. Like in the US, that gets used uh, quite a bit. Coin-operated business being a business where you have to constantly uh, chuck in coins to get something out, right? Like a, like a jukebox or a, a cigarette vending machine, that kind of thing. Um, we do uh, enjoy uh, quite a lot of um, organic or uh, a word of mouth um, uh, drive, but um, a lot of what we do is now somewhat planable and uh, and a result of our um, paid efforts. And paid for us um, is I can share that much. It's it's basically a um, a channels and geo matrix how we run our um, uh, paid efforts. So if you think of um, 
so the TV, um, print, radio, social, um, and obviously all the digital uh, channels um, on the one uh, axis of the matrix, and then geographies on the on the other axis. Um, we do have um, individuals sitting in each, at, each, at each of these intersections and have someone who deals with Facebook in LATAM and uh, and drives that uh, channel. Um, and then we've just gotten really good at our um, predictive modeling. So our machine learning guys are actually uh, in our um, marketing department predicting LTV for each of the um, customer cohorts and um, that allows us to dial our spend quite uh, quite uh, specifically yeah um, and then on top of that I guess we're benefiting from um, Babel and the product being a very positive uh, culturally tuned in feel good um, product that people like to talk about and um, and it spreads uh, naturally uh, as a result yeah and I know the the topic is is organic growth, but um, you know, a lot of what you've talked about in terms of paid and, and brand spend is very kind of tied into that. At what point um, you know, do you think in a company's life cycle is it, right, is it the right time to diversify away from kind of performance and paid media and actually dabble into this more mass media you know, brand spend? It, it, or is there a right point? How do you know um, when that is? So we had a moment quite early on in the company, which was before my time, but uh, I've, I've heard and told this story a few times um, because we do continue to invent through sort of incubation efforts and we're going through the same cycle um, of starting new businesses and ventures uh, again and again inside the company as well. And um, we realized early on that our traffic was just so small that we just didn't get statistically significant data points. And um, we needed to just up the volume. And we at some point made a decision, okay, we're just gonna increase our spend by 10X from one day to the next. And um, we had no basis whatsoever for making that decision in terms of, oh, we know where we're spending, which works. We just needed more volume. We needed 10 times more data points to then figure that out. Um, and um, one of our co-founders uh, made that decision by himself without talking to the other founders and um, told them a week in, I think at that point $50,000 later or something like that, and it was a huge amount of money at that time. Yeah. And um, it, it made a, a, a huge difference in actually figuring out what, uh, what we could do, but it was, uh, was a very um, um, gutsy move, let's yeah. put it that way. So it's kind of... S small kind of experimental bets that in over time you can kind of track their performance and you see those just scale up uh, as you see what works and what doesn't work. And taking real risks though, they, they didn't feel small at the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in the interest of keeping this interactive, I'll just pause here. Any questions from the audience at this time? Yeah, so the question, I don't know if anybody could hear it, but uh, do we do uh, content strategies on a regional basis in different languages? And the answer is yes, yes. We, we do have a uh, presence in, um, like in Europe in, in, in pretty much every, every market, um, and so you can find Babel content in French, Spanish, Italian, English, German, um, and so on. Um, and uh, and these live across all those uh, channels. So that's something that we pursue quite actively. Uh, we have um, translation teams who, who do that. Um, we have SEO teams or, or writing teams who, who write content specific for these. And then we track uh, very specifically how this content actually works and how it perform performs in the, uh, throughout the channel and what articles convert, and that informs us. Um, how do we actually um, write articles, and um, and that's just uh, traditional sort of content writing um, expertise, basically. So, the question was, what are the top learnings um, as a European company going to the US? It's painful. It's slow. <laughs> it's expensive. Um, stick with it. It takes time, um, and it doesn't work one on one or one to one exactly how it works in other markets. So we uh, were in the US for two, three years, two years, um, just not really 
figuring it out. It took us quite a while. Um, and then we started to see sort of, okay, now we have a, a, a bit of an uptick and um, we then made the decision or were lucky to find um, Julie, who's our US CEO. She used to be uh, the sort of second in command at Business Insider and COO there. And we hired her in to, um, to help us sort of scale that business up. And from that moment, we got sort of a true cultural um, switch into how does US, how does a new US audience work, how does it um, tick, and, uh, and that drove uh, adoption. So to give you a specific example of what that means for us in our industry, in our case, um, language learning for Americans is largely an alien concept. You don't learn languages at school. Um, you don't have a need to learn a language um, because everybody else speaks your language. So um, the motivations are quite different. Um, and we see some really interesting uh, motivations that we wouldn't necessarily have uh, thought of in the beginning. So it's like uh, mental fitness, for example, right? Using it instead of uh, Sudoku uh, to, to train your brain. And um, heritage-related topics. So I have um, Italian or French or German ancestors, and I want to learn about my roots and learn a language for those reasons. And uh, digging into those specific motivations then allows you to really capture the specific uh, demand that is uh, inherent to a US uh, demographic, which you wouldn't find in the same way in Europe. One of the challenges in education, and especially language, you just talked about keeping users engaged and motivated to learn. And really, you know, this is a question about how do you retain them over time? Um, how, did you, how did you tackle this and how did you overcome what has historically been, you know, a, a hurdle for a lot of businesses in education? So engagement and, and retention are um, crucial. Um, motivation in learning and in language learning in particular is something that I guess who's learned a language here? <laughs> Everyone has experienced the challenge of actually learning a language yeah. and how tricky it is. Some of us are being given the, uh, the, the joy by having um, parents from a different language, right? My kids are learning it on the fly, uh, which is uh, great to, to observe, and they, uh, they don't need an app, but most other uh, people who don't have that luck have to go through the, um, the learning journey. Um, we realized uh, quite early on that language learning isn't something that you, A, succeed very quickly with to perfection, mm -hmm. and that you necessarily complete. And so the importance of um, an app in particular is to explain to learners that this is a journey that you can have fun with, quick wins with, and um, that there are many ways of learning a language and an app can be your guide uh, through this journey. We don't um, claim that an app will um, be your end all for, for language learning. And so one of our key strategic initiatives is to connect other language learning methods into the app as well. Yeah. So you can have Babbel in your pocket and then also go and learn at a language school abroad and then come back into the app and, uh, and learn through that. So that's how we keep and stay a companion f throughout your language learning life journey. Yeah, I think that, that aligns very closely to how, you know, he, how we at Battery think about opportunities in education and that, to your point, you know, these are, education is a, a kind of a social and, a, and a, an experience that you have with people, right, and not a, an interface on a desktop or, or a, a phone. So. Um, I guess more specifically, uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, the kind of the language travel product that you guys have rolled out and how that makes sense and how it ties into the, the experience as a learner. Mm, yeah, so, well, since this is the marketplace conference, um, so that's probably the most relevant um, uh, business model in, in our portfolio effectively because it is a marketplace. So we have uh, made a small acquisition last year, bought a, a small company, which we've since rebranded to Bubble Travel. And um, it is effectively a marketplace and you have a search recommendation and booking engine for language trips. Um, so again, for, for any um, anybody coming from a US or British or generally English speaking world, that may be somewhat of an alien concept, um, but language travel is actually a thing. Uh, so people do buy trips to go abroad 
and um, learn a language in the destination uh, country of their, their um, language. And so would you come to, to Bubble and um, find, um, let's say you want to learn Spanish, um, you, you come to us and say, I want to learn Spanish in Barcelona or in Madrid. Um, and you come to us and you get um, to find the right type of schools um, that offer you a immersive experience. And what you get there is more than actually a language course that may take place in the mornings, but very much get your guide like a full experience or set of experience because a lot of the language learning actually happens not just in the classroom, but then what I do over lunch in the afternoon, going on excursions, in the evenings, partying with my friends, going to wine tasting or flamenco course or cooking paella in, in Madrid. Um, those are the things that um, really transform how you learn a language, how you experience it, and then let you come back and go, wow, I've just made a whole bunch of new friends and uh, become fluent in a language. Yeah. And that's what, what we offer. Um, and then again, we take you back into the app and, and continue the learning journey there. The, the, the kind of the most obvious challenge with that is you're starting to actually offer a, a service, you know, to to your users, and it's no longer just an interface with an with an app, but they they're traveling somewhere, they're you know thinking about the quality of the experience they have. Have there been any challenges as you've scaled this business up, and you know, presumably have had experiences that folks may not have expected, and how do you, you know, maintain quality as a marketplace? Yeah, quality is, is, is crucial for us. So we do spend quite a lot of effort in curating what's available on the, on the marketplace. Um, and you see this at um, Airbnb experiences, right, or, or other uh, places um, where um, really um, the quality is represented already at the get-go when you see the actual experience before you book it because you, you, you generate trust by having a very good and transparent display of what it is that I'm actually getting here, right? Um, I think I remember in, in, in the Airbnb case, it took them a while to figure out that professional photography was really driving adoption and conversion rates. Right. Um, and we see the same thing. So displaying the scores and the experience in a very professional manner is a real differentiator for us and makes a real difference in terms of the quality of the ex booking experience alone. Um, and then, obviously, we have responsibility for this whole um, journey that when you go to a school, what do you experience there when you leave? What do you, um, what do you take away as a learning experience? And um, so we work very closely with the schools in making sure that um, the actual um, content and, uh, and the educational experience around the, the, the booking um, is flawless. W would we ever expect to see a Babel school? Um, so at the moment, that's not our um, strategy. Um, we don't uh, want to disrupt or um, uh, play against um, the language school world. It's a very um, fragmented world for good reasons, because schools have specializations and are very good at specific things and um, not every school is the same so you have um, the need to go to like I want to go to New York right because I'm young and professional and I want to have the urban experience others may want to go to Scotland in the Highlands mind you the English that you learn there is somewhat different but um, it's um, it's more of a natural uh, experience or you go to Tuscany and um, go in the in the vineyards and learn Italian there right so um, every demographic has specific needs, and we don't claim or we don't attempt to be able to cover this full spectrum of um, of experience and rather work with the experts in those yeah. fields. You kind of let the providers do what they do best, and your role is to just facilitate the That's matchmaking right. of the, the market. Yeah. Um, one, one last question for me, and then I'll open it up uh, for the last five minutes here. In around 2017, you launched uh, Babel for Business. So this is a... B2B kind of corporate offering to, to companies uh, for their employees. That, that's obviously a very different you know, product and a go-to-market approach to a consumer, uh, direct-to-consumer subscription business. Can you just talk to us about what, what went into rolling that out? And um, for the entrepreneurs in this room who you know, may be thinking about extending their platform from beyond just B2C and going into B2B, what are some of the learnings that you guys have uh, you know, experienced so far? Do the simple thing first. 
<laughs> so what we did was, um, I've personally experienced a lot of the B2B language learning world as well through some of the transactions that I've done. And um, B2B is grouped into sort of two buckets. One is sort of an enterprise grade, um, proper, full scope uh, language learning suite. These are SaaS products with uh, plugging into corporate LMSs, learning management systems, and, and that allow you to really monitor every employee's activity very uh, detailed and granularly. Um, for us at Babel, we're a consumer app first and foremost. Um, the simple thing for us to do was resell that consumer app. Um, sell it so that as a business, when you have a small team, or if you're a small SME, um, you, you, you just want a handful of licenses. You want a dozen licenses to, to get your team kitted out. Um, we started with that. And so we basically offer the app as is, which means from a cost, product development, implementation perspective, it's very simple and lean. Um, and um, it's also very true to the um, to the um, offering. So we don't need to make any promises that it is more than it actually is. And it, again, caters to a very different um, target group in this case. So we don't claim we offer enterprise grade. But if you look at sort of the world of corporate um, B2B um, sales, there's a pyramid, right, of, of high, large, um, uh, employee basis um, at the at the top and then there's a very broad base of um, SMEs with with um, smaller employee bases and we're catering to that uh, at first and then um, over time we might see that we migrate up which we're seeing already and we're getting larger deals and it's sort of a land and expand uh, kind of mode that yeah we're in. so it's kind of identifying exactly you know b2b is is not just one bucket Right, it's it's you can segment the market between SME, SMB, mid market, and enterprise. So focusing on the right customer segment and then also understanding the right go to market approach for that segment. Yeah, and limiting your cost and risk and at the outset. Yeah, in, in the last kind of two minutes here, uh, I'm going to open it up for any last questions from the audience. Okay, so the question was, how do you how do we see the app um, innovate, disrupt, complement the school system? Um, so I would uh, side with innovate and complement as um, as the uh, approach, uh, not disrupt. As I said, we we want to leave to the to the traditional school systems uh, the, um, the the expertise. Uh, was your question tailored to um, K twelve, so traditional high school, gymnasium in German, those kind of audiences, or private language schools? Fortunately, that's it for our time. Thank you, Phil. This was really really great. Thank you.